Okay, for the second half of this video lecture for chapter four, we're going to talk about one more um, example of macroevolution. We had finished talking about the evolution of tetrapods um, as one example in the first part of this video lecture, and also the evolution of birds from dinosaurs. But now we're going to talk about um, the third, which is the origin of mammals. So this is another good example of macroevolutionary or macroevolution in the, um, the fossil record. So um, first of all, we see some major trends here in the origin of mammals. Uh, first of all, we see that the lower jaw becomes more simple. So the lower jaw loses bones until we get to a point where we only have one, the dentary. So lower jaw becomes more simple. We see development of a temporal fenestra. A fenestra is an opening uh, or a depression. <clears throat> so a development of a temporal fenestra, fenestra behind the eye socket in particular. Uh, that's a uniquely mammalian feature. Um, we see the evolution of a new jaw joint, one that is unique to mammals uh, that no other vertebrates have. And we see the evolution of the original jaw joint bones into bones of the middle ear. Again, a distinctly mammalian characteristic. All right, so let's take a look at um, some of these changes here and some figures of um, some skulls, some fossil skulls. What we see here is a, the skull of a synapsid. So this guy would have lived maybe 300 million years ago. Uh, synapsids are basically reptilian, uh, a reptilian lineage that we think ultimately gave rise to modern mammals. A um, couple of things you see, first of all, that there's a jaw joint here um, between this bone called the quadrate and this bone called the articular. And it's a very weak jaw joint. Uh, modern reptiles still have that, um, but it did allow the, jaw, the lower jaw to articulate with the skull for opening and closing the mouth. Um, we're gonna see later on that mammals evolved a new jaw joint further forward, and these bones here, the quadrate and the articular, became parts of the middle ear. Uh, two of the three middle ear bones. All right. Um, also notice that the uh, lower jaw consists of the dentary plus several other bones, including the articular. So it's a multi-boned structure. Here in a later therapsid, so the therapsids branched off the synapsids, and then the mammals eventually branched off the therapsids. So here we see, again, we still have that same quadrate articular jaw articulation. We see that the number of bones, though, in the lower jaw seems to be reduced. Uh, we see the dentary here still, just like over here, but we're losing some bones uh, in the posterior portion of that. This is an early cynodont, what, what's known as a mammal-like reptile, so becoming more mammal-like. We still see the quadrate and the articular, <coughs> but we now have <coughs> the um, cheekbone developing here. And the temporal fenestra is the space behind that cheekbone. So this is a uniquely mammalian feature. Wasn't present in these two guys. All right. Still later on, we see uh, a later synodont. Uh, again, the temporal fenestra is a space right in between the cheekbone and the skull, the brain case. We still see the, the quadrate and the articular uh, working against one another. But now we have a new articulation located inside of that uh, cheekbone <clears throat> right in here. I can't really see it from this, from this angle, but it is there. We see the dentary is now a, um, a much larger part of the overall lower jaw. Okay, moving forward in time, now we see an advanced synodont, what you could consider to be basically modern mammal, so mammalian, um, with the exception of the fact that you still have the quadrant in your articular, but you also have a new um, 
excuse me, a new articulation between the dentary and the squamosal, which is up inside here, right inside there. This guy actually had two articulations, one here and one here. Um, these bones, the quadrate and the articular, had not yet uh, moved up into the middle ear. Okay, and now we see over here on the right, we have the lower jaw being one bone only, the dentary, 100% dentary. The other bones have been lost. Again, the articular and the quadrate are still articulating with one another. <clears throat> but we also have um, a second, a newer jaw joint articulation, which becomes the modern mammal uh, jaw joint. All right, let's look at those middle ear bones. Um, so if you look at the modern mammal middle ear, ME for middle ear, you see the stapes. The stapes is what taps on the oval window of the inner ear, sets up the pressure wave and the fluid in there, which then is detected by your nervous system and converted into sound or transmit or uh, interpreted as sound, I should say. But the stapes is not by itself. <clears throat> um, notice that the stapes is attached to the incus, which used to be the quadrate, and the incus is attached to the malleus, which used to be the articular. And then the malleus is attached to the inside of the uh, eardrum. So when the eardrum vibrates, it sets up a vibration through these bones, which then is transmitted into the cochlea and the semicircular canals. Um, so take a look up here. Here we have an early reptile. We can see the quadrate in the articular. That was the original jaw joint. The stapes was there. Um, these three bones did interact with each other to help produce sound. So they played a, a role in hearing, but not like they do in modern mammals. Um, later on, <clears throat> in a mammal-like reptile, we see the quadrate and the articular have been reduced in size. They're in the process of becoming what we see here in terms of the middle ear of a modern mammal. Uh, we have a new jaw joint articulation. This flange on the dentary coming up is going to articulate inside the squamosal right here and become the modern mammal jaw joint, as you see right there. That's the modern mammal situation. And so once that new jaw joint had evolved, the malleus and the ecus, i.e. the quadrate and the articular, were no longer needed as a jaw joint. They could become the malleus and the incus inside the middle ear and take on their role uh, in hearing. And again, because they had a role early on in, in a rudimentary type of hearing, they were sort of pre-adapted to specialize and become uh, the modern mammal uh, middle ear bones. All right, <clears throat> so all these changes that we've just seen here, it's important to recognize that there were no new bones that evolved. The changes occur by modification of existing bones with you know, some bones like those in the lower jaw being lost. So some bones took on new functions, such as the transition of the quadrate and the articular of the, of the original jaw joint to sound transmitting bones of the middle ear. And that's what evolution does. It sort of takes what is currently uh, there and modifies it by tinkering with it. Okay, so now let's talk about another evolutionary trend, a macroevolutionary trend. Um, and a lot of lineages do show uh, trends through time, similar trends through time. A good example of a trend that you see across a lot of different organisms, especially mammals, is uh, increasing body size. Okay, uh, Here we see this with horses. You go back 60, 55 million years ago and horses were cocker spaniel sized. Hyracotherium was a good example. Uh, these guys would have been roaming around the, the central uh, you know, parts of the North American continent, today what we think of as, you know, Nebraska, Kansas, um, Colorado, that sort of thing. Um, but <clears throat> these guys stayed pretty small for a long period of time. But then about 20, 25 million years ago, they begin to develop larger body size, as you can see right there. And this is a trend we don't just see in horses. We see this in lots of other species of mammals as well. And that pattern of increasing body size in mammals is known as Cope's rule, okay? Cope's rule, increasing body size in mammals. Um, so why do we see this increase in body size? Well, it's thought, based on the pollen record, that right about here, around 25 million years ago, there was a major vegetational shift away from forests that used to cover what is now the central United States to prairie and grassland. Well, if you're 
um, a horse and you're living in a forested area, it pays to be small because you can move through the underbrush and the foliage a lot easier. These guys were also browsers feeding on, you know, shrubby, shrubby type vegetation, that sort of thing. But as the forest gave way to grassland, their cover goes away, their cover from predators. And so now they're much more exposed and they develop larger body size, probably as an anti-predator um, defense, essentially. But they also have to shift over now to eating grasses. And so we see that there's a shift from browsing to grazing as well. Um, so the, what we see as a result of that change, the change in diet, is also a resultant change in the evolution or in, in the, the tooth structure. Okay. What we see is the evolution of what are called malariform, write that down, malariform teeth in horses. Okay. Basically modern horse teeth. So modern horses have a tooth that's referred to as hypsodont. You're going to see that in the next slide. That just means high crowned. The teeth are very tall. Um, the reason for that is because that's an advantage for feeding on very tough grass. Grass has a lot of silica in it. And as they're grinding up this grass, that silica wears down the enamel. And if they don't have high crown teeth, their teeth would be worn down to nubs long before they had senester aged out and they would essentially starve to death. So we see a much uh, taller, uh, higher crown tooth evolving as a result also of that shift from browsing to grazing. All right, let's take a look. So here's a phylogeny. And what you can see here is that um, we have these teeth, which are adapted for feeding on, uh, for browsing, for feeding on, you know, uh, herbaceous vegetation, uh, that sort of thing. Um, those teeth, although it's not written here, are referred to as brachydont. These are low-crowned teeth, right? That's what you need if you're feeding on herbaceous vegetation, shrubs, and you're, you're basically a, a browser. But here we see the development of hypsodont teeth. And so again, you can see that this was, you know, this transition took place right around 23, 25 million years ago, something like that. Um, it course, corresponds very nicely with the shift from uh, forest to grassland and also with the shift from small body size to large body size. All of these different things evolve sort of simultaneously uh, in the horses. So that's a major trend in mammals. All right, here we see another look at this. So you can see a high crowned hypsodont tooth here. You see a low crowned brachydont tooth here. Um, and so remember, that Hyracotherium dated back to about 55, 60 million years ago. And we saw that the body size did exactly what the tooth morphology is doing, right? Body size was stayed pretty small for a long time, but then right around 20, 25 million years ago, body size increased. And that's what we see, where we also see a shift from brachydont teeth to hypsodont teeth. Um, so again, these patterns all sort of correspond with one another and probably driven again by the shift, the climatic shift in vegetation type. Okay, so next thing I want to talk about is a, um, a very um, important hypothesis that was developed back in 1972 um, called punctuated equilibrium. Let me write that down here real quick. I don't have a blank slide, but punctuated equilibrium. This was developed by two, um, two scientists, two biologists, uh, Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge. So Gould and Eldridge developed this um, hypothesis basically to explain uh, apparent gaps in the fossil record. In the fossil record, there are gaps. There are, are gaps that we know are a result of lack of fossilization, but there are also gaps that are less easy to explain. And so if you look at um, some hypothetical examples here, you see a situation where you, know, you have this one grouping of character values, and then you have a gap, and you have a second grouping of character values, another gap, and a third grouping of character values. Um, so what Gould and Eldridge wanted to do was develop a theory, basically, to explain these gaps. Now, if you look at that hypothetical data, it could be explained 
by phyletic gradualism. If you had a complete picture here, you know, maybe you'd see a continuous um, sort of anagenesis type pattern of evolution of a character uh, over time without, you know, cleogenesis, without production of new species, that kind of thing. It could also be, however, that it's explained by punctuated equilibrium. So in punctuated equilibrium, what you have is uh, long periods of no change, so like this right here, right, vertical no change on the character value, punctuated by rapid change to a new equilibrium state or stasis. That goes along for a long time with no change, and then you get new punctuation, rapid change again, and to a new, uh, a new sort of stasis uh, or equilibrium state. So the idea is that maybe these gaps that we're seeing here are just periods of evolution that happened so rapidly that it wasn't recorded in the fossil record. That could be. We know that there are good cases, good examples of that in the fossil record. And that's what Gould and elders were trying to do. Now, if you zoom in on this, you can see that, well, you still have um, gradual change. It's just really, really rapid, right? You still have gradual change. It's just that the pace speeds up so much that that change is not recorded by, you know, episodic uh, fossilization and, and sedimentation and that sort of thing. It could, however, also be that we have what's called punctuated gradualism, where you know the lineage evolves in rapid spurts from one equilibrium to another, but um, speciation does not necessarily occur. Notice over here, you get splitting, right? This is a speciation event. Gould and Eldridge said that you couldn't have evolution without speciation, and that's why their um, idea was so controversial back in 1972 and why it's actually still controversial today. Today, we know you can have evolution without speciation. You can have anagenesis, as we see here. So it could be that this pattern is also explained by punctuated gradualism. So you have rapid change here, but it's anagenetic in the sense that you have one character changing into something else over time. You don't get splitting and development of new species. All right. So, again, Gould and Elders proposed that some gaps in the fossil record uh, might actually correspond to periods of change that occurred so quickly the changes were not recorded, okay? They proposed that lineages may exist in a state of equilibrium for a long time, like you see um, right here, for example, or here, with little or no change, that's called stasis, but then undergo rapid change to a new, a new equilibrium. And so that's why they call their hypothesis punctuated equilibrium. It's an important evolutionary theory today. All right, let's look at some examples. So here on uh, this top panel, this top figure, we're looking at the evolution of teeth. I believe that this is in, yeah, moles, so uh, grass-feeding moles. Uh, this is phyletic gradualism. So we see relatively gradual change in the overall tooth morphology, right? Molar morphology index. We don't see evolution of new species here, we just see gradual change in one character over time. Uh, here over on the right, however, we have a good example of um, punctuated equilibrium in bryozoans, what are called moss, moss animals. You see we have one species that goes along for a long time with relatively little change, a new species branches off really fast, really quickly, it then goes on and evolves for, or, or with relatively little evolution for a long time, new species branches off that with new stasis, Another equilibrium or, um, punctuation event here, more equilibrium, another punctuation event, more equilibrium. So this is what Gould and Eldridge had in mind when they were developing punctuated equilibrium. And that model, that, that theory, certainly does explain this pattern that we see here. It does not explain this one. This is more of a phyletic gradualism sort of model. Point is, evolution can play out in a number of different ways. <clears throat> we shouldn't shoehorn horn ourselves into thinking about it just in terms of one of one. Um, overall pattern. All right, here we have some other examples. So in this example, we have um, what's called directional evolution. So this would be a good example of anagenesis, right? You got some uh, character like shell conicity that is gradually changing over, you know, five, six million years, something like that. Here on the right, we have punctuated change. So we have Rather, rather short period of stasis, punctuation right here, rapid evolution to a, a new 
level of stasis, basically. Uh, we didn't talk about random walks, so don't worry about this one. You can kind of cross that one out. Uh, and there, then here we have uh, a situation of stasis where we have something, you know, some feature like length to width ratio of some character that just doesn't really, the average doesn't change much at all over a long period of time. Again, these are all just different patterns that we see in the fossil record. All right. What about rates of evolution? So how fast does evolution occur? Well, the amount of change in morphological, morphological character is uh, usually measured as the number of standard deviations around the average value for that character that the character changes, changes over time. So this unit um, is known as the Haldane. Okay, the Haldane. So the Haldane then is just a standard deviation unit change. Um, and so whenever we see, for example, you know, let's say the height of a fish scale changes by 0.0036 uh, standard deviations per generation, we can see that in the fossil record, uh, from the original mean value, that means that that height of the fish scale has changed by 0.0036 Haldanes. Okay, so remember we talked about um, JBS Haldane, an early biologist, revolutionary biologist, back in the first or second chapter, one of those uh, three that was so critical for develop, development of the modern synthesis. That's where it gets its name, JBS Haldane. Okay, so the majority of characters in fossils show slow rates of evolution. Overall, gradualism is what we tend to see, but the rates do fluctuate. Um, as an example, Hyracotherium grangeri, so one of these early horses, uh, changed very little over 650,000 years but then evolved very quickly as the transition from H. grangeri to H. amulor took place. And that's what we see here in this figure. So here we have the lower surface area, okay, a measure of that, and we have meters up a stratigraphic section. So think of this as a cliff or a rock outcrop. This is, is lower down toward the base of the crop, outcrop. This is toward the top of it. Obviously, as you go from the bottom up, the rocks get younger because sedimentation lays down on top of old layers of sediment. And so what we see here in this grouping, that is uh, H. grangeri, okay? And we can see um, really very little change in the average value of this molar surface area index. But then, right, and this represents uh, basically about 650,000 years. Here though, we see an abrupt change in the tooth structure, and this is actually a new species. And you see that it happens about right here. So, um, I'm sorry, nope, wrong axis. It happens right about there. So right around 1800 or so meters up that stratigraphic section. So here we have an example of stasis, and then an abrupt change to a new level of stasis, All right? So, Again, this is showing that rates of evolution do, do vary. We have very little or very low or slow rates of evolution here, rapid change there to a new level of equilibrium where we have, again, low rates of evolution. All right, 